feet. I'll dog my face. I wanna get you on a quarter feet, Charlie Chase. Go crush. Charlie Chase, as cute as the bee. You sell your soul to the devil to play like me. Well, I'm the R. Ruby D. And you got a lot of nerve when you play against me. You know you're gonna get third. Go crush. Shady L. The Lord's the Lord. The Ruby D. My man, your shit is on the board. You all can't ball. You all can't ball. I'm the K. Kevin Kevin. And I'm not the face. You know I eat your ass up like a steak. Go crush. 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 Um, remember, there is no uh, eating or drinking in the auditorium. Um, this is Holler Brown. It is the uh, premier and probably the only location that houses everything that is important to black culture. That's why we are so honored to be able to have the Hip Hop Film Festival here, particularly this year as we celebrate um, our culture. Now, everyone's saying that this is the 50th of hip hop, the 50th of hip hop. It's the 50th anniversary of when our culture was seen by the mainstream. This culture has had many different names. It's gone through many different iterations. But this building stands as a testament to how long and rich and deep our culture goes. So while the outside world celebrates finally seeing us after 50 years, we are here today to understand that a evolution and a revolution is happening in how people understand how these things came about. We can no longer let the media dictate what our history is just by listening to a song that comes on the radio. We are more than that and we are bigger than that. So tonight, we are featuring documentaries that tell the true stories that um, speak to the true history of this culture and that was picked up through the music, through the dance, through the art. And it was really the struggles of life that people were going through. Oh, give me one second, one second. We coming, we coming. You know, I like to talk. Um, but it's important to say that and to preface tonight with these words that to remember that um, the big, the piece that you guys, guys came to see tonight is called You Can't Erase Me. So remember that as we begin to delve into tonight's program. Now you can start. <laughs> Making of the first album, Long Live the King, we were there with the second album. I got on there and produced by DC Moby B. Miles has been hanging out with Russell and he wants to get into hip hop. Even when he went to Arista, the very first music was mine. When he went in that booth, yeah, he just like, right out. Yo, you did the biggie stuff? Yo, I'm gonna work with you. From Tony Tony Tony, he's over there on the guitar. Elise is on, on the piano. piano. Everybody was on a <laughs> real instrument except for me. You only have to do is say, yo, man, his beats, it was so hard. He was just such a soulful dude. If you just said that right there, yo, he was such a soulful dude. That's enough, that's fine with me. Janelle Mecca Holmes, and Mr. Tony Wesley. See you here. Okay. 
you know you were there and a tiny bit. Okay, so before we get into the feature of this evening, um, I wanted to bring these amazing and revolutionary brothers up to the stage. First, to talk to Moby about his story and why this documentary is being made. Then to talk to you, both Janelle and Tony Wesley about why documentary storytelling is so important, particularly now. Um, so, Mo, there's a microphone right next to you. Give us a little uh, background for, for the youngin in the house that don't understand. About Easy Mo B? That's right. Well, he asked me the question earlier. He said, who is Easy Mo B? Because we've been doing some taping for a documentary that I came up, that we're coming up with. And my answer was, Easy Mo B is a DJ a producer, a drummer, a lot of people don't know that, a father, um, a son, and a lover of music, particularly all things vinyl. When we're in such a digital world, I still have this connection with the vinyl. It's, it's, there's nothing like the needle in the groove, that sound, and that, that's connected to my original beginning with hip hop. It's, it's that beat of the street and that's easy Moby. I like that. Mm -hmm. Tell me why you decided to agree to have your story told. Well, a, a lot of people know about me as a, a DJ and a producer, but I told, um, Mecca, I told Janelle, I wanted to take it um, a little bit deeper. He suggested it too, that in addition to the musical achievements and the DJing and the producing and all things music, I wanted to also be about all things about my life. Um, cover me all the way from a little boy, from a kid, um, being in the living room when my father was playing the the gospel, the, that's where my original connection with the music comes from when he was playing uh, James Cleveland, Dorothy Norwood, Howlin' Wolf, Lightning Hopkins, Jimmy Reed, James Brown, Aretha Franklin, Sam and Dave. Um, my father's the first original connection to the music for me. He's my first inspiration watching him play 45 and album after album. And then um, when I grew up and I got around my teen years, my early teen years, as early really as 10, 11, or 12 years old, but I'm telling my age right there. Those were the disco years. Mm -hmm. there, there wasn't even hip hop yet. They were bringing the systems and the big speakers and the turntables out in the park. and. I watched this guy stand in the middle between the two turntables and he had the mixer in the middle and he's like controlling the park, controlling the sound. And I noticed that he would have like two copies of the same record and focusing on that one important part of the record and making it loop round and round over and over. And I was like, oh, I wanna do that. I wanna do that. Um, and then I heard guys like um, this guy here, a friend of mine is in the, in the audience, <laughs> Special K, one third of the group of the Treacherous Three. And um, after getting my cheap little setup, they were, it were, the, the brand was BSR turntables. We used to call them, as kids, we used to joke around and abbreviate it for bullshit record player, but, but <laughs> <laughs> BSR. But I got my, my cheap little system, and um, every DJ had a name. And I loved Treacherous Three, in particular in the group. I loved um, Cool Mo D and the name that he had. And I said, I need a name. And I took um, 
He was cool, so I took a similar adjective, easy. He was M-O-E, I said drop the E. And my family nickname is Booby. My mother gave me that name as a, as a kid. That's what I'm known on my block in Brooklyn. So easy, Mo, B. Thank you, Special K. Thank you, Treacherous Three. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's, it, it's, it's not cool to bite. <laughs> right. That I so, always so. say that's the first rule of the culture is no biting. Oh, yeah, no biting. No biting. People don't understand that. And nowadays. I didn't think that I would grow to the level that I am today sitting here on a stage talking with you about it. So... You know, if you want to call it a bite on Cool Mo D's name, I really didn't think I was going anywhere. Yeah, or was that's gonna, more of a respect. Or was going to ever yeah. be anybody. Yeah. We'll, we'll so, Kay, you can tell Cool Mo D, I'm sorry for biting. <laughs> <laughs> no bite. Respect to y'all, brothers. So, let me ask you, Janal, um, why, why this story? Why Mo B's story? And um, why is it important? that it be told? Um, first and foremost, you know, it's an honor working with this phenomenal brother. Um, he is not only one of the greatest hip hop producers, but just one of the greatest music producers. Um, his music has inspired my life uh, from the days of Big Daddy Kane, another victory, calling Mr. Welfare, and especially the Miles Davis project in which he uh, won a Grammy. And that was Miles Davis's last album. That was just a historic, epic project. That was like the first real collaboration with jazz music and hip hop. So um, Easy's music affected me spiritually. It, it, it motivated me. And he's just a phenomenal man and, and brother. So his story really needs to be told. Um, a lot of times, you know, people see him. It's like, yo, you did the Biggie. You did the Craig Mack. And there's just so much behind this man, um, it's phenomenal. So I wanted to make sure we did justice to his legacy, his story, um, something that would last for hundreds of, hundreds of years to come. And, and when, he, when he presented the original concept to me for doing this, I like um, what you said, Mecca, you said, um, we gotta be able to tell our story while we're here, because if you don't, do it now, like after you're gone, somebody else is going to tell your story. And they're going to tell it wrong. And exactly. You, you may not like the way that they tell it, so. Yeah. yeah. Continue. Yeah, so um, again, just an overall honor for him to allow uh, me to do it. Um, again, Janelle Mecca Holmes, um, I'm the CEO of Supernatural INC, we're a multimedia company. Um, just to release the film two weeks ago on Amazon Prime called Surviving the Hill uh, that addresses addiction. Um, one of the stars of that film, Terrence Fredericks, is in the audience. Um, also, uh, we're 90% completed in working on the uh, S1W project of Public Enemy. Um, so 90% uh, completed with that project. So, you know, it's about protecting legacy and, you know, making a difference with your creativity, not just for monetary gain, but it's about legacy. And, you know, I have honor for Easy Moby's legacy, so. Love that. Um, so I want to um, bring Tony into the conversation at this point. Now, there's a microphone right next oh. to you, Tony. One, two, one, two. There you go. Um, Three, four, I'm sorry. <laughs> and at this point, because now we're getting into the nitty gritty of understanding why our stories need to be told and producing documentaries um, for, for the world to understand our stories and to understand what's behind the music. It's not just what they hear on the radio. So Tony, can you speak into the process behind uh, our center, the, the process behind making the centerpiece film for tonight, which is You Can't Erase Me and Why? Well, it was, it was easy for me to, to create something like this because what we are missing as black filmmakers is that we are so talented that we have been given from God abilities. And I used those abilities much earlier in hip hop. 
So I do film not so much for myself, but we are losing a lot of legends. So Mo, you write, stories need to be told. But I thought when I did my films, I've done 10 of them. They're not released yet. It's a series called You Can't Erase Me. It was to, one, tell the story, because our stories need to be told, correct? But two, show them how gifted we truly are. See, I want to be the blueprint. I want you to understand that you have to implement what Hollywood is implementing. So I went further, and when I shot, we traveled to the United States to get the interviews. And we set it up like Hollywood set it up, and we used reenactment, you know, and we used drone. And it was quite expensive, and I, there's no debt there, though. See, that's the key. I realized that if I had to take, partake on this adventure, that I would have to do it basically with me and one partner at the end of the day. But I would need the cooperation from all of my peers because I was there. So I said to myself, what is the motivation here that you know the stories, that people will respond to you, and God has blessed me with intellect, with my seventh grade education. You see, we all have a story we all have similar stories. So what better way to have those stories capture the world? See, I didn't do this for hip hop. I did it for the globe. So these legends could have a career to be up on these stages, telling these children, these mothers, these fathers, I did it, don't do it. So it's very important to me to have them understand what um, conglomerate, startup means. It tickles me every time I say that because I'm not rich, but my films are conglomerate. They're costly, but we're still a startup. And I just wanted to be that blueprint. So when it comes to these stories being told, and um, Mo, I, I definitely want you to answer this question to start, because all of you have rich histories and rich stories that deserve to be on screens, all three of you. Mm -hmm. um, but in this instance, Mo, what do you want people to take away from your life? What is the term, what is the, the thing? Because we know the music, yes, and we have our, our affiliation connection with the music, but what is it within your story that is going to inspire within this documentary? What hurdle are you overcoming? Because we see you as the producer. Mm -hmm. Besides the music, just as a man, if I wanted to be remembered for something, I want to be remembered for my level of integrity. I want people to know that while I was here that I wouldn't just do anything for a dollar. So are you gonna be delving into those types of stories oh, yeah. where you oh, had yeah. to make that choice, you know, that, yeah. that imagery of the devil at the fork in the road yeah, type of situation? Especially at this point in time in, in uh, music, particularly in black music, um, the direction that um, hip hop is going in, I mean, there's a reason to be selective you know, it's, I feel like it's important, period, to continue the, the legacy of, of black music. I'm talking about the original elements of jazz, funk, soul, blues. You know, hip hop is all of that. Yeah. But those original elements that it drew from, we have to put that back into the music, back into hip hop, into all of the music. It's important from this point on to sustain that. And that's what I'm all about. I think maybe that's what my love of the uh, vinyl and the records, I think that's where it comes from. I'm taken back to a better time. It's symbolic. Yeah. yeah. I'm, when, I, when I play that record, I put that needle in the groove. I'm taken back to a, 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 a better time, a better place. Uh, and music is like a thread, it connects us all. You listen back to it, like Al Green, you don't even gotta go that far back. You listen back to early 90s, Pete Rock, CL Smooth. You play Feel the Heartbeat, Treacherous Three. 
there's like <laughs> there's some electricity that flows through it you. your soul immediately. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't I don't like to bash people, but a lot of the music right now doesn't. You can, bash, you can say it. No, nah, no, nah, I'm you not. You can say in, it. It's a nah. safe space. No, nah, <laughs> I'm not into bashing. You know what I mean? We we all got the right to as creators to do whatever we want to do, but in terms of the original elements of black music, jazz, funk, soul, blues, some kind of way. It don't, and it don't matter that, that it's just hip hop, because a lot of people look at it like it's just hip hop. No, hip hop drew from all of those original elements. Mm -hmm. And we gotta find some kind of way to put that back into the music. Tony? All of my films will do two things. It will start to attach history because we have been segregated. There were five elements to hip hop. And people talk about the year it started, it didn't start here. The reason why it started in 73 because Herc established three of those elements with that party. Knowledge is a gift and a given. My films will show truth on the blindness of the public, the viewers, the listeners, and it will also connect individuals and our culture from West Coast to East Coast because we all knew each other. I miss the wave. I danced around the world, but I ate at his house. I ran with T. La Rock in the streets. We all hung out, but mainstream media as well as the corporate body have separated us for power and that destroyed the record companies, it destroyed the MCs, and we lacked that first generational knowledge, not integrity, but knowledge. We didn't know business. Independence too. Yeah, so this establishes that because there was a false narrative, and the problem with that false narrative is, is that we created it. Just like I thought I had a chemical imbalance with my anger, and it's not true. We kept saying we did it just for the love, just for the love but there ain't no one saying that today because we didn't see the billions to be generated. Well, my stories tell and catch the liars, catch the folks that made them hundreds of millions of dollars. And then I have truth to power in my stories. So when you have MC Light speaking and Shantae speaking and Curtis Blow speaking, it sets history straight. But then when you have the artist laying out what happened with bare witnesses, it just can't be denied. So I, my stories are the truth, their history, and there's redemption. And that's what we love is the redemption. And perfect segue into what we came to watch tonight, which is the first episode of You Can't Erase Me of the docuseries. Um, Tony, can you uh, tell us a little bit about what we're about to see? What you're about to see is a, a brilliant mind um, that uh, thought he had it all because he was so intelligent. He was before his time. So because he's before his time, he lacked the business side of it, and the trust came with self-power. So he felt powerful because he was in front of everyone and allowed the snakes in. And it just kept biting him. Mm. So this story is about a man's walk from his career to today. You couldn't have said it more perfectly. Please give an amazing round of applause for the legends that are on the stage. <laughs> Janelle, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for bringing Moby, and I can't wait to have you back. Thank you for having us in your space. Appreciate that. Definitely. All right, gentlemen, go and take your seats. We're about to see a show, honey. Right. <laughs>